Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be joined here today by Sue Parker Hall, who is a certified transactional analyst, a UKCP registered psychotherapist, and a member of the World Council for Health Mind Health Committee. She's also the author of Anger, Rage and Relationship, an Empathic Approach to Anger Management, specializing in trauma processes and anger, rage and shame. So first of all, thank you, Sue, for joining me here today. Well, I'm I'm absolutely delighted, Rebito, and I I so love what you're doing on your channel. You know, I think at this time we all need to be the best we can be, the highest we can be, vibrate, you know, at our highest level. And I think your channel really contributes to that, the, the, the kind of, on all levels, from the nutritional to the emotional, to the community level and spiritual. I think, you know, you cover all those different, very important aspects of our being. So thank you for that. And I'm delighted to be here talking with you. Well, thank you so much. That fits in really nicely with the first question that I ask anybody when I do these podcast interviews which is you mentioned you know that we need these different aspects in this especially at this time when was your awakening moment as I call it or when did you realize that things are not the way that we were told they were and Mm -hmm. also any other little background you'd like to share Hmm. every time I tell the story it seems to get earlier um, and I've, I've noticed that with others as well. Every time they think, when did I wake up? It, it creeps back and creeps back. Um, but I think practically, I, I went to university in the late 80s. And unbeknownst to me, I was indoctrinated with, with um, critical theory, uh, radical feminism, and in particular, Marxism more generally. Um, And what that did was really spoil my early relationships because my attitude towards men was quite despicable, really. Um, I feel as though I'd I'd been educated into not liking men and finding finding fault with them and, and thinking they were kind of lesser beings that were in need of, you know, massive improvement. Um, And... I mean, thankfully, I've made amends with my early partners and healed all that. But there was definitely a a kind of dynamic of I'm okay, you're not okay, um, throughout my two kind of early significant relationships. So um, my waking up was when I realised the really negative impact of of the critical theory on me um, and how it had spoiled my relationships. Um, and then I became a, 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 a men's activist. I know that sounds odd as a woman, but I, I do think women can say things that men can't say. We can say things that men would be called whiners about, you know, if we if they started talking about all the disadvantages. I mean, a lot of people are blind to men's disadvantages, um, and, and I think women who can voice that are quite useful to be honest I mean the disadvantage in so many ways I the the one I always go to is this very high suicide rate for men and and I do think that if if four times as many women as men were committing suicide that would be a a national emergency you know so so many resources would be galvanized to to deal with the problem but it's, not, it's almost like men are disposable, whether that's sending them to war or dirty, dangerous jobs or, or suicide. It feels like there isn't the same respect for men. Um, so it, that's a really important cause for me to, to be involved in. And I, I have done a little podcast. It's, it's only 30 something episodes of 11 minutes um, <clears throat> called Man Made. Uh, and it's just um, each each one is an issue discussed, and then there's a good guy of the week, a little scenario at the end, um, which just gave me such a lot of pleasure and delight to share. And um, 
I have have told that you know it has helped some men's self esteem to to kind of have the difficulties that they face acknowledged, you know. So I don't know how that signs Rebecca. I didn't know I was going to say all that. No, it's really interesting. It makes me also. I mean, it's also quite unusual um, to uh, you know you raised the. The, the suicide, the high suicide rate of men. Mm. It's quite unusual for people to, uh, to, to take that perspective, um, at least in my experience, because most people talk about how women are um, disadvantaged and uh, very, very, very seldom is it discussed, you know, the disadvantaged, the, the, the side, the, the perspective of men and how they can be disadvantaged in society. There are many. It just makes me want to grab. Oh, I have got a book that's this thick, um, that is full, page back cover to cover, of uh, hard evidence of men's disadvantage. You know, um, whether it's education, whether it's health, physical health, mental health, um, the law courts are a big one, children's children's services, law courts, divorces, you know, this, yeah. A it's, lot of evidence. Is that also because you said that, you know, part of your awakening or realising that things are not the way we've told they, we've been told they are, uh, was during your education? Mm um are, is that evidence and those studies and and is that also discussed today in mainstream education do you know no 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 this this is all independent researchers and i mean m as you know my interests are <clears throat> anger and rage um and i i began my work in the domestic abuse field i worked with women uh, in refugees that was my first work and then because it's a multidisciplinary, multi-agency approach to domestic abuse, some of the men that weren't doing very well on the, um, what was then the Duluth model, which is a, it's actually a, a, a radical feminist model, which says the only cause of domestic abuse is men's sexism and men's wanting to control. It, it ignores about 12 other possible causes of why people would get rageful and, and hit each other or emotionally abuse each other. Um, and, and men didn't fare well on those uh, often. Uh, and those who didn't fare well would come and work with me. Um, and, and what I noticed was both parties, if you covered up their names, which would identify their sex and, and, and um, covered up their sex, they had the same early developmental traumas both of them I mean really early people don't get into domestically abusive relationships and they don't domestically abuse unless they're really traumatized and really often early on um, and, and can't soothe don't think well of themselves feel you've got to fight for every bit of affection or um, need to be met so that was quite an eye-opener for me and yeah. I, I always, always go with the more symmetrical um, statistics, you know, that men and women are equally abusers or almost equally abusers. Um, and, and that's according to the ONS. So it's not it's not a fly by night piece of research. It's, you know, the National Ordnance National Survey. Um, and there are a few universities um, up, up your way, actually, you know, Birmingham, but City of Birmingham University, um, the, I think it's the Lancashire University, where where they've got um, research projects into domestic abuse that are not gendered. You know, they're just interested in what causes it and how do we work with it. Not putting it through a men are bad, women are good, you must believe the woman kind of filters. It's more human. And that, that was the motivation for me writing my book, was wanting it to be seen as a human issue, not, not a gender issue, you know. 
Um, yeah, we can go in so many directions now that I wanted, I was thinking, yeah, that we should talk about your book. But before we do that, what just kind of popped into my head was, um, you know, that all. so right now people are, are uh, seem to be focusing on uh, the, the uh, what is it, the central bank digital currencies and also on um, I'm trying to think what the other one is that everyone. So obviously, there's, there's the war, and um, 15 minute cities. Is that is that one? Yeah, that also, and all these different things that you can refocus your attention on, kind of post COVID, <laughs> if you like. Yes. And yes. for me, what 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 you're saying is, you know, that if we had a healthy society, mm-hmm. there wouldn't be either any abuse or there wouldn't be certainly as much abuse uh, going on in the household and for me that seems to expand to um, if it is the system itself that needs the healing or rather you know we need to be living in a society where we are growing up um, in a way where we are learning to know ourselves and uh, take care of ourselves and have strategies to deal with anger and to deal with rage and things like this. Mm. And so every kind of uh, individual problem always seems to come back to, I guess you could call it a meta problem, which is that we're, we're born into a society that is not nurturing us properly from the moment that we're born I don't know if you'd like to comment on that but that was just what what came to me also when you were talking about how uh, the the abuse itself so the the reason that people are abusers is Mm. because of very very young Mm. experiences that people have had and if if they hadn't have had those experiences it wouldn't have manifested in the way that it has that's spot on, Roberto. I mean, I'd go as far as to say that people don't abuse who haven't been abused or neglected themselves. You know, there's no, there's no other explanation, um, I don't think. Um, and, and what you're saying has triggered a couple of things for me. Um, the system is our ultimate container in a way. Um, and, and if it's hostile, if it doesn't hold us safely, securely, and doesn't nurture us, that is a trauma, you know, that is a trauma to, to not be able to lean into a system that supports us, you know, gives us quite high anxiety um, and, and we, we struggle to settle and soothe ourselves. But the bigger container still, and I'm mad as hell about this, Rubito, our planet, has been turned into something hostile, you know, has been through, through the climate change ideology, has been turned into something that's punishing and to, that makes us scared, um, you know, that adds to human anxiety. Um, it's a massive existential anxiety. Um, and, and to be told about that as young as, you know, little primary school, children and and upwards I I think it's utterly diabolical I think it's utterly wicked um, to to kind of frighten frighten us all or attempt to frighten us all um, that the very thing we rely on for our survival may not survive Um, so I, I do feel quite passionately about that how a, a source of what should be a source of wonderful security nature you know has become contaminated by this ideology yeah planet earth that climate change was the other one i was thinking you know people are going to and and looking at that um yeah we live on a we live on a living organism you know the planet is this big giant living organism which is wonderful and magical and mystical and we're being taught that this is a dangerous, hostile place that we should be afraid of. Mm. It also kind of brings up to me this idea that we're 
fundamentally we're good, you know, that people say that it's in our nature to be aggressive. It's in our nature to be angry and to compete and to fight with each other. Mm. And what you're, what you seem to be suggesting is that that's not the case. I agree with you. I think, I think Freud's had a lot to do with this, you know, because, because Freud talks about us being at the mercy of these destructive drives. You know, I can never remember all of them, but one of them is a death drive and, and um, what, what, one is about um, sexual gratification with no regard for, you know, consequences or that have to be tamed. So, you know, we're, we're, we're basically destructive beings that need to be managed and dumbed down and civilized, if you like. We're, we're basically uncivilized and we need to be civilized. Whereas I take a much more um, humanistic Rogers view that we're all inherently good. <laughs> uh, it's just environments that are, you know, that are shitty or environments that are bad, um, which is why a lot of healing comes from getting yourself in good relationships, you know, respectful relationships like therapy or friendships or partnerships. Um, because that then makes the organism begin to settle a little, you know, to stop defending itself or needing to protect itself. And then to, to let some of the more tenderer feelings through you know the losses that have happened to me the disappointments that have happened to me the, the things that make me angry now now I think anger is a really good thing I think it's rage that we should be steering clear of you know I think our, our anger comes from a very regulated place you know I can express it in this tone of voice like I said about you know telling children that you're all going to die because the planet won't support you anymore I'm using my anger, you know, to, to look after myself and look after others. But it, it's rage, which is completely unregulated, that is harmful. You know, I need my anger for my assertiveness, if you like, to say, you know, I'm me, you're you, we're different. Or I have a different need, or I, I don't want to do that now. I, I might do it later, but I definitely don't want to do it now. Setting limits and boundaries. You know, I think it's a really, really useful um processing emotion uh, whereas rage is not a processing emotion that's that's a, a trauma symptom that's a, um, a dysregulated hyper arousal or i talk about cold rage which is a shutting down and a hypo arousal a withdrawal and a freeze or a flop kind of response and we we all want to stay in this middle bit where we're feeling our sadness and letting it go, feeling our fear and doing what we need to do to look after ourselves um, and feeling our anger. What do I need to do to protect myself? And once we've done that, we can return to joy and peace and calm until the next thing happens that takes us out. We do what we need to do, return to peace and joy. So when, whenever I'm working with people, I always want to help them stay in this zone here where they're in their processing emotions. They're not, they're not getting anxious, agitated or enraged. Um, and they're not withdrawing, collapsing uh, with, yes, going, going inwards or even catatonics, the extreme. So this is a healthy, lively, have all your feelings, but, but feelings that are important pieces of intelligence that tell you about what's going on and that guide you into taking the action that you need to take to return to a bit of peace and joy and tranquility if you know what I mean yeah um well you know when I, when I do the um hypnosis you know I say release any negative images feelings thoughts emotions but I also say mm. see them acknowledge them understand them but don't go into the drama Yes, and what, what, nice. what, what you're also saying reminds me of when I, I, I've done years of meditation mm. and meditation, you know, when you talk about the rage is, is the unhealthy state. For me, that, that sounds like going into the drama. So you're losing yourself in that emotion 
Yes. And you're no longer observing it. You're no longer processing it. You are it. Or in spirituality, you know, in Buddhism or something, they talk about you've, um, you know, you've gone into the ego. You've gone, you, you've gone into this state of you're just lost in this uh, conditioning or in this emotion. You've just got lost in there. And so the meditation part, you know, some people feel as I did when I first started doing meditation, it means becoming kind of numb, you know, you're just kind of watching it and you're, you're just not engaging in life, but it is actually observing your feelings, observing your emotions, seeing how you feel, yes. uh, but, but remaining in a state where you don't get lost into it. Yes. Um, is yeah. that, is that similar to, the the therapy you do where you are trying to help people to stay in this box where they're kind of <laughs> processing the fight flight freeze exactly that's exactly it you've, you've nailed it there Rabito. um and it, it's interesting i work with obviously i work with a lot of people with rage issues and they always talk about the rage experience as that wasn't me you know and and it isn't them you know, if we talk about the processing emotions and the joy, that's where we're being ourselves. You know, that's where our identity in the world sits. And when we go outside of that, whether it's to kind of hot rage and agitation or whether it's to cold rage, depression, withdrawal, we're not ourselves. We, we kind of tumble into a universal zone um, where we're not distinguishable you know as individuals so people have to take responsibility of course they do for going into rage it's it, i'm not saying people weren't themselves so you know we, we give them a pass um but there's a truth in that they're they're not themselves they have left <laughs> the core part of themselves to to be in those places yes i agree with you so your book is anger rage and relationship an empathic approach to anger management and also it specializes in trauma anger rage shame um on cpn um i i see quite often comments you know where they where people say it's 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 healthy to be angry it's good to be angry mm. um and then perhaps just before we started recording we just briefly mentioned this kind of um or maybe you could share, you know, when we were talking about the demonstrating or or going out into an anger state. So at, at what point is it healthy to be angry or, uh, you know, it, are there different types of anger, some angers that are healthy and others that are less so? Mm, that's such an interesting question. And of course, I can only answer it from my perspective and my frame. You know, there's lots of ideas about anger and rage out there. I think my one of my main contributions to my profession has been to differentiate between anger and rage. <clears throat> In traditional psychology, you, you, you have anger and rage on a continuum. So you might have annoyance, irritation at this end and homicidal violence at, at this end. And <clears throat> what I've done is said no, anger is a completely separate phenomenon it's a processing emotion it's part of you know sadness and fear I always keep the processing emotions to three that seems to be enough for anybody you know I know people like Ekman have come up with eight and other people have got 11 but I feel that anger sadness and fear are enough processing emotions to work with um, whereas rage is a is a trauma symptom it's an overwhelm. It's when the organism can't process. And I, and I call rage a, a, um, an experience processing difficulty. We, can, we can't process things. They pile up, pile up, pile up. And, you know, one wrong word, off comes the lid, out it all spills. Whoever's on the receiving end thinks, where the heck did that come from? You know, it's not about the here and now. It's about a whole load of unprocessed raw experience that kind of gets discharged in you know in one go kind of thing um so what we don't want is people being activists from from a rage 
per, per dynamic. Um, we, we don't want them coming from the Cartman drama triangle, which you mentioned earlier. You know, if, if people haven't processed enough of their archaic rage, if they haven't processed enough of their archaic trauma, they are very likely to be bringing old wounds, you know, to the situation, old grudges, you know, um, and, and, and to be behaving in a way that they're not that likely to be heard or listen to that they'd be easily dismissed or they'd end up arrested or you know or in a prison or just not taken seriously anyway so you've, you've got the drama triangle if people are still quite traumatized they're likely to to rescue rather than rather than be adult ego state activists which i'll talk about in a moment they're they're, they're wanting to make it better for people um, um and, and they'd be marshmallowy and 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 not 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 really have any boundaries really or or clear clear goals. Then the other one is persecuting persecutor. So you're you're just persecuting somebody. You're 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 not going to be heard if you're just persecuting somebody. They they're not going to listen to you. Or you come from a victim. So you're you're kind of not empowered. Not, none of these positions on the Cartman Triangle are, are empowered uh, positions and they don't have an impact. They're not effective in the world. Um, what, what we need to be in is our adult ego state, having processed a lot of the old trauma or at least recognising it if, it if it comes in and do something about it. Um, and I talk about outrage. I think when we've, when we've processed enough of our archaic trauma, we can be outraged on others' behalf. So I see anger as protecting the self and the identity and a lifelong protector of the self and identity in all situations. When, when we're comfortable with our anger, we can move in amongst very diverse groups of people and our identity doesn't feel threatened. You know, we can be, I can be me, you can be you and our differences are enlivening and enriching, they're not, not threatening. Um, but if I'm in a, a rage, then I'll be openly hostile to difference because I can't cope with difference. I, I very easily would lose myself in, in the other, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. So just to quickly just point out, because we, we just briefly talked about this before we started recording. So the 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 pyramid we're talking about is as you said victim persecutor and savior yes. um so yeah it was a few things so well i'll go to the first one the first one was i can imagine people thinking as you're as you're saying this you know the savior yes. um what's wrong with trying to help people what's tr what's wrong with trying to save people um, what about people that are doing, uh, um, you know, working for uh, organisations that are helping refugees or people in war? You know, what's wrong with that? No, I think I think you're making a really good point there, Abito. Um, one, one aspect is um, that it's at, at the cost of yourself, that there's a kind of martyring that goes on, that you're not looking after your own needs. That, that's one kind of shadow side. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? The shadow side of it. Um, what's the other side? Yes, I, I was thinking of, and I, I'm really sorry, I can't remember who said it, but about teaching people to fish rather than giving them fish. You know, it's, it's, it's not about not helping, but it's about helping in a way that I think you would say empowers, you know, and, and allows people to, be, to become independent and in their own sovereignty and not, not reliant or um, dependent on others, which is what the rescuer does. They make themselves indispensable and, and uh, you know... Put their own needs... You're a role for themselves, yeah. Not yeah. only second, but sometimes put their own needs last. Yes. Or, yeah. or neglect them completely. Yes, that's right, that's right. Um, so I assume you're not saying that people shouldn't be getting involved in in things that are you know directly trying to help others but more we need to make sure you know it's, it keeps coming back to we need to make sure that we're okay yes and then when we're okay 
we can help others from a from a place or from a space <clears throat> uh, which is optimal absolutely and we have no investment how they be you know and we have faith in them the other person that that they have got resources or they can find resources um what was I going to say? You just said something that sparked something. Yeah. So if we think about, for example, a universal benefit. Now, for some people, that's absolutely essential. And they, they, their, their existence absolutely depends on it. But, but universal benefit might be extended to a group bigger than that. And actually, what might be more helpful is, is to be helping them become more empowered and earn a living and provide, uh, get educated, you know, get into networks where they're going to thrive. I think, is that an okay example of a of the difference between a rescue and empowering? Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, the, the well, the, I, I guess not what we're talking about now is the most helpful, um, yeah, the, 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 I'm trying to find another word, but yeah, the, the, way, the, the way that we can be of most help yeah. is to help others to be able to help themselves. <clears throat> yeah. And focusing on uh, work, you know, if we wanted to get involved in work that's helping others, then perhaps trying to find an area where the work that we do enables those people to be able to then help themselves. Yes. rather than us just trying to save them just trying to exactly or shield them shield them um give them resources which they could easily develop themselves or already have themselves just given the right circumstances to discover that yeah i'm just i, I keep coming back to um i can imagine that this conversation might be <laughs> could be annoying a few people um Yes, you yes. know, like say refugees, for example, you know, yes. that have just arrived on a boat and they don't have anything. Yes. Um, again, it doesn't mean that you don't want to go and help the refugees, but you can help the refugees, uh, first of all, get them out of that dangerous situation. Yes. And then we want to be helping them to find somewhere to live, how to access food, how to access clothing. So it's it, the focus should all be about re-empowering the other person. Is that kind of right? Absolutely. And I think, I think what you've highlighted there is I'm thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we have to meet people where, where they are, you know, and, and the very foundation level is having a roof over your head, food in your belly, you know, food security, accommodation security, you know, so that, you know, that sounds absolutely spot on. That's the funnel that we want to help people go down. And then they can start to, once they're safe, can start to express themselves in the world, share their talents and gifts in the world, you know, for, for, for income or bartering or whatever reason, uh, whatever, yeah. Would you say that the persecutor could fit into, um, you know, some of these feelings that people have right now, which also could be coming from a rage state, yeah. um, you know, where people are saying that there's people out there now as a consequence of the last three years that need to be hanged. You know, I want to see these people hanged. Yeah. And um uh, and then also uh, the, the other one is the victim, uh -huh. which is there's a lot of people right now, not just right now, I've been through this process myself, but mm -hmm. there's also people out there that just think the victim, we're doomed. There's, there's nothing we can do. We're doomed. These people at the top of this, uh, of this archaic pyramid have got too much power. Um, would, they, would those be kind of too examples that would fit into persecutor and victim from this covid scenario they absolutely would and they also fit into hot rage and cold rage so you know the persecutors in a hot rage off with their heads or um you know wanting a violent uh, outcome although i have to say if it if it's just a fantasy i i support people's revenge fantasies because I think they're, they're stepping stones in people's recovery. Um, having a revenge fantasy 
can restore your dignity, you know, temporarily, you know, in that moment, having some sense of getting your own back or getting them as humiliated as you've been or whatever is an important part of trauma recovery, but it is a trauma symptom. And, and I actually say to people, you know, well, you won't act on this, will you? But it's really important that you that we keep, you know, referring to it and thinking about it. Because as therapy progresses and as the traumas are processed, that revenge fantasy gets milder. It gets milder until there's an acceptance and it's it's gone. So I do think there's a place for revenge fantasies, obviously not acting them out. Um, and, and I can really identify with a, with a kind of need for accountability. You know, I can really identify I've got that myself that I want people to be held accountable um yeah there's a reason that that the a, a justice system has always been in place in any type of society so yeah. as far as I'm aware at least the majority of societies have had some sort of a justice system I mean even yeah. if even if it was exile you know you have to leave yes um so I on the cold rage and the hopelessness and the despair because I think that it, that it too is a trauma symptom you know that that despairing we're all doomed and there's nothing that can be done um that is a trauma symptom and I'm not surprised people feel like that we've been horribly traumatized on every level of our existence so just... yeah and we talked about climate and the planet obviously also with the last three years yeah. Um, the amount of trauma that people have gone through from, as you said, uh, re re not just realizing, but living in, in scenarios where we're in a host, where, where the world we live in is hostile towards us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I was thinking right before when we were talking about that, uh, and you were, you were talking about when you are, um, in an anger state but not in a rage state that you're not reacting to all the different scenarios and situations around you yes. um there was a doctor recently where i am currently who said that all these people that have been uh saying that freedoms are being taken away and that there's something suspicious going on over these last three years they must feel very silly now because it's all over and uh you know, because from her perspective, everything's gone back to how it was, where, where I'm living currently, you know, it, it's not on the news, um, COVID vaccine, uh, vaccinations ended and all of that for now, or whatever's coming next, we're not sure. Um, and I very rarely now get into a conversation with someone about this, unless, like almost never now, um, because I've moved from trying to, you know, wake people up to just being an example of how, how we can be. But I did, I stepped into this conversation and it was so different to any other um, types of conversation that I've had with people like this. And, uh, and I just said to, well, I don't agree. And I can, I can show you information if you like that, you can look at it and then you can decide that there's a flaw with it mm -hmm. or you would have to accept it as objective truth. I, I'm very willing to share that information with you, but it will change your worldview if you accept it. And it's, uh, you know, it's quite a difficult process in the beginning to go through that. And then she said to me, well, it must be, she said, ultimately, it must be a very um, sad, depressing place to be if you can't trust the authorities, if you can't trust the institutions. Mm -hmm. And it also reminded me, that that actually reminded me of um, a conversation I had with uh, the Twin Towers um, back at, in the War on Terror. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend uh, said to me that, you know, I've looked at the documentary from the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and I've seen all this stuff, but I don't, I can't believe that anybody would be that cruel and that mean and malicious to do this. So therefore it can't be true. And I know I'm rambling a bit now, but, but no, my okay. final takeaway was, 
It's actually a positive because what it shows is that people are full of love, they're full of trust, they're full of kindness, yeah. and they actually don't want to believe what they're seeing in front of them because it would mean that 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 love and trust in humanity is broken down and that's such a fundamental part of most of our identity isn't it and such a profound grief i would argue rubito that those of us who have allowed this reality to dawn impact it's a massive grieving process to sit and be with it, isn't it? You know, it's not an easy, it's not an easy um, cross to bear, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, no, it's... Uh... The, whole, the joy and the love and the beauty on the one hand and the, the dire, dark, diabolical um, shenanigans, sorry, can't think of a better word, on the other to be able to hold them both is a mighty stretch and it's a it's a big developmental process for us i think to to be able to do that to hold them both yeah it's like we're being forced into into a a a, a, a kind of a more rapid evolution um That's a good way of putting it and I was very impacted by one little phrase of what you were saying is the expectation that we just carry on as if nothing's happened. And that, that's another thing that, that does stir my anger, because I think we do, if we're going to recover, we do need to acknowledge what's happened. You know, we do need to tell the story of it. Um, that is the only way is to tell the story with the feelings, have it heard and witnessed. And it's, you know, we move on, but to not give time and space to our story, uh, you know, just carry on as usual. I, I've been horrified that schools have just gone back to curriculum, you know, SATs, business as usual, when children have been so heavily impacted and traumatised that I think they should be playing for a year, you know, and telling their COVID stories for a year and, I really don't think it should just be plunged into business as usual. No, it's igno it's it's just yeah exactly it's just uh, I mean this is why this doctor was saying that you know it's all finished now is because that's what we've been presented you know now move on forget about the last three years and we'll 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 move on and then of course there'll be another thing that will come that will uh, we'll, we'll do it all over again which is why it's so important to be able to uh, to process anger and to process these different emotions that come up, sadness, mm. uh, depression, hopelessness, uh, all of these different emotions. So, so, sorry, but maybe just going back then, because I'm just kind of trying to weave it together. Yeah. Uh, the victim, the persecutor, the saviour, so the saviour could also be, I've mentioned some examples and so have you of what the victim and the persecutor and the saviour could be. Uh, another example of a saviour could be, you know, all the children that had been harmed, uh, wanting to help them or just, just feeling that uh, carrying the weight on your shoulders of the fact that you can't help them. Mm -hmm. What would be then the idea what would be the ideal for people that are watching this that are feeling you know that they, they they are feeling the weight on the shoulders of the people suffering or wanting revenge or just trying to see what the other one was i gave um or or feeling that everything is doomed that would be a kind of a victim role so so where, where would people watching this what would be your advice for them that's normally my question at the end but what would your advice for them be for, for what to what to do with that triangle or what to do with those different states okay well if you're on the triangle it means there's trauma that needs processing so it, it really is about finding somewhere some environment where you can talk about what has happened to you and it might be the past three years or it might go way 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 back um i i worked full pelt full tilt all the way through covid with a full psychotherapy practice and i can tell you that being being 
locked down meant that a lot of people remembered the last time they were locked down and not allowed to go out and you know when they were powerless in that regard takes them back to early life so I think it's really important I think of us as pots with untold stories in and it, it might be worthwhile just taking a few minutes just to draw a pot and just think what stories what events have happened to you that you may not have been able to feel through or get over or grieve about um, <clears throat> because they do pile up and they do put stress on the organism and eventually as you know they cause physical illness so I, I think it's about what's in your pot do you need to process and clear a space you don't have to empty your pot it, it's just clear a space so that you can more easily deal with things in the here and now um, effectively and not have them keep piling up, piling up, piling up. Um, so it is yes. getting off that triangle and, and it's being an adult in your adult ego state. When you're in your adult ego state, you know your limits. You know you, know you can't tackle everything on your own and, and you can chunk down and moment by moment you can do what's needed or what's helpful in this moment. Um, find a community, you know, a tribe, a community. Um, I, I set up a, um, a, a support group for what I call differently aware psychological therapists. And we've been meeting for about 18 months now. And I'm as supported as anyone that comes to the group, by the way, <laughs> it's for my support as well. Um, and, and we're just able to tell the stories of COVID how it's affected us and, and some of the things that we're distressed about that's happened to clients, um, all with complete anonymity, of course. But um, so we need communities to regularly, regularly off, off, it's not offloading, it's processing, you know, sharing and empathizing and supporting. That's what I think. Yeah, two, two, two things come to mind. One of them is the, the huge importance of community. So yeah. having other, talking with other people yeah. and having other people around, arguably it's even healthier if it's in the physical real world than, than online, but any type of community. Um, and the other one is, you know, when people say, I don't need therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you said, you know, this is as helpful for you as it is for the other people that, you know, that, that, that join this, this group. Yes. Um, I think people that do some form of therapy are very aware that, uh, that we need it ourselves, or at least we should be. A good therapist would say, you know, that I also need to do my own work and make sure that I release stress and that I do my, I've got some practice that I use. Um, and that therapy is not something which means that there's something wrong with you. Um, we, we all, it's something that it basically we're all dealing with a fight, fight flight, freeze, yeah. um, that's going on. Absolutely. There's a few things in there. One is, I think our, our need for others gets horribly buried, you know, um, the, the culture is largely one of you do it yourself kind of thing. And especially the British culture, you know, stiff up a lip and you soldier on and you do it by yourself. Um, the other thing is, obviously, if our early childhood needs weren't met, then we absolutely bury any need we have for others. And we kind of make a decision that we're never going to need others again. And, and if you've made that decision, you very likely don't see the the benefit of therapy you you don't know you can't imagine why it would be helpful to talk to somebody you know it's never been helpful in the past so why would it be helpful now so there's a kind of blindness I think to how helpful th therapy can be if your need for others is buried you know um, and also not knowing what it feels like to be out of that triangle mm -hmm. you don't know until you're out of it Yes. the how much better it feels that's so true how 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 thrilling it is to be in your adult ego state 
you know, where you've got, you, you talked about intuition when we got together, you know, when we're in our adult ego state, we've got our intuition, we've got our emotions. Those are two compasses, you know, to guide us towards or away from, you know, and, and we can make really good decisions. The frontal cortex is online and we're sharp and we can assess risk and reality check accurately and, and make the best decisions for ourselves and others. You know, that's our job. And through, throughout COVID, I was doing up to three hours self-care a day just to keep myself in that in that zone. Um, I mean, just just a few months ago, I realised that all that did was symptom management. And I, and I was actually like knocked over by a bus when there were no lockdowns this past winter. It's almost as though my organism relaxed a bit. And I just realized just how attacked I'd been, if you like, uh, by, by COVID. So then I had to begin to do a bit of recovery work and processing and just acknowledge. And I think that's the danger of carrying on as if nothing's happened. We're not going to, you know, acknowledge just how much it hurt us all. Absolutely, yeah. I've got a similar experience. Well, I just came back from a week in England and uh, took a complete week off from all the different, you know, work that I do, the hypnotherapy, the CPN and the interviews, and just went kind of back to my previous life, if you like, of just watching TV and eating food and going for a, uh, my, my stepdad took me into the Peak District and oh, took my girlfriend to the city, to Nottingham and yeah. showed us some nice spots. Yeah. And then I came back and then I realized just how stressed I'd been because it was, it was, uh, it was, it was just, I was releasing stress just by taking that time out yes. and and it kind of just relates to what we were just saying that afterwards you you feel the difference between yes. how you're feeling now and how you were feeling before yes and I would have said I was fine and I was fine I was performing and functioning really well in the world but actually at my core I wasn't fine yeah, yeah. That's the same for me. I've been I've been overworking myself. So yeah, I'm now going to be. Um, I'd already decided to do this before I went to England for the week, but to to as you say, kind of reduce or you said something kind of chunking down yeah. the the workload and giving myself more time. Yes. Um, because yeah, we all we we all need it, and and to and I and I think when we're out of you know that we've we talked about the pyramid and we can talk about some of the other ego states mm -hmm. but when you're in uh, a healthy space yes. a good thing is that you you can you can see it you can see what you're doing to yourself yes 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 that's so true yeah i just wanted to mention you mentioned with the with the book um empathic approach so yeah. it's an empathic approach what what does what what does that mean uh, for you then an empathic approach to management so, okay, just tell you a little bit about the origins of it. Um, it, it definitely came out of my dismay and anger at the radical feminist Duluth model and what it was doing to men. Um, at its worst, and I'm not saying all the Duluth programmes were, were delivered in the worst possible way, but at its worst... It, you, you had to take responsibility for every act, even to get on the course. Every act that you'd done, you had to take responsibility for to get on the course. Now, that is a nonsense to therapists. We know that that's an outcome of any therapy. You know, that, that's an outcome. Anyway, so that was the first thing. And then, I don't know if you know the power and control wheel, but there's eight different segments on it. And they're all different forms of abuse now the wheel is brilliant it does really a good analysis of harmful behaviors in relationships and there's also a positive wheel that gives you an antidote they're brilliant but the way they're utilized has been very harmful so men were told that they had abused in all eight sectors and and, it, and they couldn't say but I never did use the children or I always handed my money over you know at the end of the month 
they, they would be told they were in denial or that they were minimizing. Or if they said something like, she hit me first, there's blaming. So the, the little thought stopping mantras are denial, minimization, blaming. And that would be told any time the person wanted to share their story or their version of events, they were told minimizing, blaming, denying. So it, it, it was a real mess with your head kind of process. And understandably, a lot of men didn't do well. I researched people who were disgruntled. So it's not a control group situation, men who were disgruntled. And they, they ended up saying they had to lie. Oh yes, I did use the children. Oh yes, I did hang on to the money in order to pass the course, in order not to go to prison or to in order to have access to their children. So it's an abomination of a course. Anyway, so what I wanted was a was a, a human approach rather than a gender approach. And empathy means, empathy means constructing it in a way that's empathic. So I call it an experience processing issue. Can, can you hear the empathy in that? It's not that someone's bad or they've done something wrong. It's, there's an experience processing issue. Um, and, and the empathic approach is, is literally what I said. People don't be abusive if they haven't been neglected or abused themselves. So what's in your pot? And, and I would look with them at what's in their pot, separate them out, because <clears throat> everybody's pot gets all, all, all kind of inveigled together. Um, and, and we have to differentiate and separate out the stories um, and give them time and space and air. Uh, and then their organism gradually settles and soothes and, um, and through the relationship, they learn how to settle and soothe themselves. Um, so that, that's the kind of empathy really. Yes, you have to take responsibility for it, um, but it, it's not your fault. That's the truth. If you haven't learned how to process your emotions, how to notice them, label them and process them, you know, that's three different stages of things you have to do with them. If you haven't learned that, that is not your fault, but it is your responsibility as a grown up to learn that. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I use that a lot it, um, in the hypnotherapy, you know, the, the, the realizing, realization that it's not your fault. fault. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then also with the inner work as well, um, you know, so for example, if somebody's um, had quite traumatic events from childhood from parents, it's usually from parents, um, the, the acknowledgement that you know, they had their own baggage, they had their own drama, they didn't do their inner work, you know, you said it's kind of still your responsibility to process that. And if you don't, mm. then the person who's then the victim of that scenario, the child, um, because they've not uh, processed that drama, it means it had really ultimately nothing to do with them. Mm. And then the, the good part of that is that then it wasn't your fault. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So that's that's what I that's what I think I mean. And I call it anger management and it isn't anger management. <clears throat> it's the transformation of rage. But nobody ever puts that in the search engine. So I have to call it anger management. Rather than processing rage, which is what it really is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to move on to transactional analysis. We've talked a lot about this uh, this this pyramid of uh, when you're in drama, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but transactional analysis, which I don't know very much about, but it's it's much more than that. Um, could you maybe explain to people what transactional analysis is? I'll do my very best, and I won't be doing it best service, obviously, because as you say, it's. It's complex. There's different schools of it, ranging from the classical, which is kind of quite cognitive and behavioural, through to the relational. That's the end. If you're in therapy with me, you might not even hear a TA concept mentioned because I'm in the relational end of the continuum. Um, <clears throat> it was developed by Eric Byrne 
it was developed at the end of the Second World War to work with veterans or demobbed people. Um, and it, it was a, it's a very, very speedy way uh, to get people into their adult ego states um, and, and to, to, to kind of help them be more useful for themselves and for other people. Um, the most common concepts that people know are the Cartman drama triangle that you're talking about, the parent, adult, child ego states, the I'm okay, you're okay corral, there's four different positions. And if we talk about activism, unless you're I'm okay, you're okay, um, you're, you're, you're not in your adult ego state and you're not an effective activist. You know, there has to be respect, you know, for who you're, you're um, coming into contact with, or at least you have to come into contact with them respectfully, put it like that. So the I'm okay, you're okay, corral, I'm okay, you're not okay, you're okay, I'm not okay, neither of us are okay. They're all different positions. Um, and then the idea of script, like very, very early on, we write a script for ourselves unconsciously, what you can expect from the world, what can you, what can you expect from people, what can other people, what you can expect for, for yourself or from yourself. Um, and that we unconsciously go through life um, with those limitations, really, they're limitations. Um, and we keep finding scenarios that will reinforce you know the the the, the old script um <clears throat> I, I don't know is that is that helpful enough is that yeah yeah so it's you, you so you're helping people to rewrite that script is that yes yeah to break out a script and and when we break out a script it can feel horrible it can feel very scary it can feel terrifying it, it can feel um uh, so alarming uh, because our our love if you like or approval has been so conditional so conditionally based on living this script being like this but not like that denying this part of myself but bringing this forward you know not being a whole person um, and when we let go of script we can feel chronic guilt so guilt is often a sign that you're <laughs> that you're looking after yourself you know that you're stepping out of an old pattern an old script or it can feel very scary and people can really wobble so like you you mentioned before that anger you know we've talked in depth about how anger can be a very helpful emotion and it's a very it can be a very positive emotion also yes. um and so also um guilt can also be a positive I mean, this is also something which is quite paradigm shifting in a way, because we there are certain emotional states that we associate as being negative, such as guilt and anger, sadness. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're saying is that these can actually be seen as a, as a positive process. Well, I think I think feeling guilt and still doing it anyway is, you know, not letting the guilt stop you from making a new decision or doing your new behaviour. Creating change is 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 positive. Um, I think. Uh, what do I want to say about guilt? I mean, guilt and not shame. Guilt is really useful because it tells us when we've transgressed, you know, our values or we've harmed someone. And, and once we acknowledge that, we can make some amends. You know, we can acknowledge what we've done. We can say we're sorry, make some amends, promise not to happen again, ask for forgiveness. You know, that would be an apology with all knobs on it. Um, so it's useful in that regard. Uh, but guilt that stops us moving forward, you know, that's a break or glue is not helpful. Yeah, it just it takes me back to the anger, you know, you going into the guilt, losing yourself in the guilt, rather than just seeing and acknowledging that you've got that guilt, but yes. then uh, moving forward. Yes. Anyway, what what for you is the uh, how would you define the difference between guilt and shame then? Okay, um, I've, I've got four sides of A4 of research I've done on this. I'll try, I'll try and remember a few kind of highlights of it. 
So um, guilt comes from the adult ego state and shame comes from the child or it could be a shaming parent part of you. So ad adults, guilt is adult ego state. Um, guilt emerges alongside us developing thinking. So like 18 months to three years, whereas shame is, well, we can, I link shame with feeling bad. Something bad happened. If nobody's there to help me separate myself from the event, I don't come to understand that something bad's happened to me. I think I'm bad. So that's how we walk around with shame. And that, that can be, I don't want to get too esoteric, but if, if, your, if your egg and sperm have been in shamed or traumatic environments before they come together, you know, you're, you're, it, that's where, you know, it goes back that early. That's what I'm trying to say. Any, any bad environment that, that vibrates, makes, makes you feel bad, can we be mistaken for I'm bad so yeah guilt so guilt I am um, is, is about what I've done shame is about who I am and that's a, that's a critical difference isn't it um shame is is associated with a lot of mental health issues you know like addiction like suicide depression you know, guilt isn't, guilt's not associated with anything like that. Um, I mean, I, I'm very happy to give you the A4 piece. If yeah, you know. definitely. I'd be very interested to see them. Yeah. Um, and, and about five minutes, Rebita. I hope that's all right. I've got a client at 11.30. I hope that's okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I mean, there's so much more we could talk about. Uh, I wanted to mention quickly ego, just because... Yeah. Um, you know, like in Buddhism and et cetera, ego, I would describe it as just our conditioning. So we're trying to free ourselves from our social programming. Right. But obviously, you know, in psychology uh, and also in hypnotherapy, when we talk about ego or parts therapy, yeah. these are different aspects of our self. Yes. Um, is that how would you describe, you know, what, what these different ego states are? Um, well, they are, yes, they are parent, adult, child but they get more complicated than that. So within your child, you've got an internalized parent, you've got your own little infant child. And if there's enough good interaction between the internalized parent and the, your actual birth child, then a little adult pops out, you know, a little separate self, you know, that, that will grow into its own unique identity but if there's not enough good interaction between the parent and child no little sense of self or adult emerges and and that, that's the kind of um that's the hardest work to do um i i think if what you're asking about is sub personalities uh something something like that um we we do we do work with parts um they don't always fit neatly into the PAC model though. You know, they don't always fit. You can't always determine exactly where, where they've come from, you know. Not yeah, I use in, well, in, in my hypnotherapy, I use parts, but I, I've kind of created my own. It's like bring your own, bring your own animal, which represents power, strength and truth. Oh. and and that animal and then bring the animal that is your play joy and laughter wow um, and then you know and then communicate with those what would the play joy laughter do what yeah. would the uh, strength power truth do in this scenario but That's when you talk about the adult state yeah. um and that you said the self also yeah. is that intuition for you so when you feel your intuition you're connecting to that connection the, the um, spiritual connection gets distorted and um, fuzzy if you're not in your adult ego state. If you're in your adult ego state, that's the, the kind of sharpest connection you can have with your spiritual self or higher spirit or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, intuition is in the adult ego state and so is 
a spiritual connection and so is a connection to your body you know a real deep connection to your body as well what what well, maybe in the future we can do another interview because uh, now we could go into body awareness spiritual awareness and all of that uh, so just quickly to finish then so uh, if, if you don't mind just very quickly so mm -hmm. people that are watching this that are resonating with some of the things we've talked about and are feeling um, uh, and are really struggling let's just say struggling in these changing times um, what 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 is what is some advice that you could give someone um you know you said go to a you can go to a therapist you could get help from a therapist but what what could somebody do themselves at home today yeah so yeah so it doesn't have to be a therapist you know a, good, a kind friend a, a wise elder we, we all need a wise elder um yeah a community um i i think growing ourselves up again is really important and, and I have a favourite, favourite book by Jean Ilsley Clark and Connie Dawson, and it's called Growing Up Again. And the joy of it for me is it's got every developmental stage positive affirmation that's needed for, for us to be feel OK in the world, OK about ourselves and OK about others. I think of kind of growing ourselves up again. And it's a process I'm still I'm still, you know, involved in. I think it's lifelong. Yeah, so growing ourselves up, strengthening our adult ego state, you know, what, what's fact, you know, what's the truth, what are we intuiting is the truth and the direction we should be moving in and um, differentiating ourselves, individuating and differentiating and standing in our power and truth. I think, you know, we're, we're kind of unstoppable if we do that. Absolutely. Uh, very quickly, the, how, how can people find you online then? So what are your links and your websites and things like this? All right. Well, I've got um, empathicangermanagement.co.uk is my website. I'm on various counselling directories. Man Made, M-A-N-M-A-I-D, is my podcast. Uh, Eventbrite, if you're a psychological therapist and you'd like to be part of an online community for support, um, you can go on event event bright and just put differently aware psychological therapist and you'll you'll get to the groups that you can come um i've got a couple of presentations on world council for health mind health um i'm sure there's other things i can't think of anything else right now thank you so much for this interview it was thank wonderful you. i thoroughly enjoyed it Rabita. thank you i've been to places i didn't think i'd go to and <laughs> Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you too. I'll put all the descript all the, the, the links in the description wherever you're watching or listening to this. Yeah, and uh, well, perhaps once I've got all these interviews out, we could we could go back and do another one and dive deeper from where we left off. I'd love to. <laughs> Great. All right. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye, Roberto. Bye bye.